The year is 30 AD. Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave three days later. Before ascending into heaven, he appears to his followers uh, in, in various times and various places. He tells them to wait until the gift that he promised them, the Holy Spirit, would come to them. He gives them a global mission to reach the world. And then 50 days later, the Holy Spirit comes on the apostles, the disciples, in power. And they begin to proclaim the wonders of God in different languages of the earth. People are moved by this. Peter then gives the first great evangelistic sermon in history, and 3,000 people have their lives changed, their hearts transformed that day. These new believers then gather together in, in Jerusalem at the center of the, where the church began. They're meeting every day in the temple courts. They're meeting in their homes. They're sharing meals together. They're praying for each other. They're being generous to one another, and they're, in, they're, they're marked by love and, and compassion and generosity and service, and they begin to grow together, praising God, and everyone knows about them. Then as Peter and John are heading out to evangelize, uh, spreading the word through miracles and through preaching, they're going to the temple one day at three in the afternoon for a time of prayer, and on the way there, they see a man by the gate called Beautiful, who's, who's crippled, he's been that way since birth, and they heal him in Jesus' name. This draws a crowd, because everybody knows this guy, and the Jewish leaders, the same ones who put Jesus to death just about 50 days before, uh, hear about it and come, and they're upset. They warned it. Peter and John, they actually arrest them and drag them off. And while they're dragging them off, 5,000 more are transformed in that moment. The church then continues to grow as it's persecuted, multiply, still locally in Jerusalem. Now up to this point in the story, the church has faced some external opposition from Jewish leaders, from those in the Roman world. But inside, it's been doing great. Exploding in growth, marked by love and service and compassion for each other, They've been, it, things have been really pretty remarkable, but all that's about to change. And I want you to know that what we're going to study here in Acts uh, are realities for the church in any era. Don't fall into the trap of thinking this is an ancient story, it doesn't really relate, relate to us today. The stuff the early church faced is the same central issues we face today as God's people in the world, even though it might look a little different. So um, let's open our Bibles, if you have them, to Acts chapter 4, or you can follow along on the screens. We'll read verses 32 through chapter 5, verse 11. Acts chapter 4. Longer section here, but I want, you'll understand why in a moment. Chapters and verses were added later, of course, to help us find stuff. But it wasn't written that way. It was written as a story. It's better that we start in chapter 4, verse 32. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. But they had everything in common. And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. But a man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge he kept back for himself some of the proceeds, and brought only a part of it, and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit, and keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard of it. I don't think so. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, how was it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard of these things. That may be the understatement of the entire Bible. It's a sobering story. And I confess that I approached this text with a little fear and trembling of my own. As a matter of fact, when Pastor Brian and I were laying out the series in Acts, which we were very excited about, we first took the whole book of Acts and broke it down into um, narrative sequences. 
stories that could be told in series, preaching series. And then we started looking at breaking about individual sermons. And then we went through our own personal and church calendar and started to assign who was going to preach which sermon. And when, I, <laughs> when this text was assigned to me, I, I thought, really? He's the senior pastor. Why? Oh, is there some way out of this? And I, I, you know, and I, I really was quite nervous about it. Uh, not, not the least of which the people are dropping dead and there's money involved. But uh, I, want, I want to be clear about something. There's no such thing as the perfect church. You see that here. Sometimes you think, well, we can just go back to the early church. They had it right. There's no such thing as the perfect church. You know why? Because people are in churches and people are not perfect. And if you ever find a church that you think is perfect, I will warn you, do not go there because you'll be the one to mess it up. The end of chapter 4 describes this remarkable movement of generosity among the believers. Uh, four, verse 32 of chapter 4. Look back there again with me if you have your Bibles. It's not on the screen. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. That's a remarkable statement. They, they, had, they had belongings. Stuff belonged to them. They just didn't view it that way. They didn't see their stuff as their own. They, didn't, they weren't uh, marked by the word mine. Parents, did you have to teach your kids the word mine? No, my guess is they sort of figured that one out on their own, didn't they? And early, too. You have to teach them things about sharing and about caring for others. They seem to know, mine, mine, I want mine. The, what we're being told here is these early Christians in the church had belongings, had possessions, but they didn't look at their stuff or their lives as their own. They saw it as God's and an obligation to each other. That's very important as we go on. And that's been the mark of a church, a healthy church throughout its history. Now in this passage, we're getting kind of a curtain pulled back, inside look at the early church. We've seen externally how they were growing by conversions and people hearing the gospel. Now we're looking at how things were inside the church. And quite frankly, we're looking at the danger within. The danger within. Now it's important to note that those who were selling property and giving money we're not being compelled to do so. Did you hear that? That's critical as we go forward. Those who were selling their stuff, land and property, and, and giving their money to the apostles, laying at their feet, the apostles' feet, to be distributed, were not under compulsion. There was no program that told them they had to do so. The apostles did not mandate it. This was not a church campaign. They were compelled by the Spirit. Their own, the gospel working its way into their own life, they wanted to do this, and they were doing so. There's no reference, no mention of this being a compulsory thing to do. Now, I know it's easy to get caught up here in the part of the story where Ananias and Sapphira breathe their last and fall down dead. And we'll get to that. But I don't want us to miss the point here. This man, Barnabas, Joseph, also called Barnabas, son of encouragement, that's what he's known for. There's a direct contrast being drawn between him, what he did, and what Ananias and Sapphira did. Ananias and Sapphira, and I want you to hear this again, were not killed because they did not give all the money. That is a complete misunderstanding of the text. They were not judged and they did not fall down dead because they held back some money. That's not why. Peter says as much, doesn't he, in verses 3 and 4. He says, when it was unsold, wasn't it yours? No one made you sell it, in other words. And once you sold it, wasn't the money yours to do with as you pleased? No one made you give it. So there's no, they're not being punished for not giving all. They're being punished for what then? Hypocrisy, in a word. Hypocrisy. For wanting to look as if they had given all. For holding back some and wanting to appear like everybody else. Hypocrisy then, hypocrisy is important to define. Hypocrisy in the church, in our hearts, is not falling short. We all fall short. We all say we believe in forgiveness and we, we act in unforgiving ways. We all say we believe in sacrifice, yet we act in selfish ways. Um, hypocrisy is not missing the mark. That's sin. That's hum humanity. Hypocrisy is, I, I don't want you to know that I missed the mark, and so I pre put on a pretense and a facade to look as if I'm better than I am, so that I'll get credit, praise, recognition from you. All the while, it's a facade. It's pretending. That's their issue. And we might think, well, that's not that big a deal, just in case you wonder how big a deal it is. To quote a few authors throughout history, can you guess who I'm going to begin with? Clive Staples Lewis says, How difficult it is for us all to avoid having a special standard for ourselves. D.L. Moody, 
What we want is to be real. Let us not appear to be more than we are. Don't let us put on any pretense, any assumed humility. Let us be real. That is the delight of God. God wants us to be real men and real women. If we profess to be what we are not, God knows all about it, and he hates the sham. George MacDonald, half of the misery in the world comes from trying to look instead of trying to be what one is not. And Charles Haddon Spurgeon, of all things in the world, most that stink in the nostrils of men and God, hypocrisy is the worst. They wanted to be seen by others as radically generous without actually being radically generous. Hypocrite, the word hypocrite comes from the Greek word Hippocrates. It's an actor, a play actor, one who plays a part. And sadly, this is, as much as the church has also been, often been marked by generosity and sacrifice, right alongside of it has been this counterfeit, hypocritical faith as well. Let's look at kind of an anatomy of hypocrisy. First, believing the lie. Believing the lie. Look at verse 3 of chapter 5. Peter immediately knows what's going on here. Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? He sees this is not, this is not just Ananias concocting the scheme. This is an attack of the enemy. This is our enemy's fundamental characteristic. He is a father of lies, Jesus tells us. If you have your Bible, turn to John chapter 8, verse 44. Jesus speaking to the Pharisees about the nature of Satan. John 8, 44. You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Peter sees this and he says, look, this can't be allowed to go on. This is not just telling a little fib here. This is not just spinning it a little bit in your own direction. This is taking on the nature of the enemy of God and his people. And it's coming into the community of faith. The mark of the enemy. Lie. Deceit. It's a very serious issue. Well, what's the lie specifically? It's the same lie that he's been telling. The same deception since the beginning, really, since Genesis chapter 3. You don't have to obey God to have a good life. You don't have to do what's required of you. There's a shortcut to spiritual maturity, to what you want. You don't have to go that way. You don't have to give all to be seen as if you did. You can have your cake and eat it too, spiritually speaking. You can have the recognition. You can have all that you want. God is actually holding you back. You don't have to obey him to have what you want in life. It's a shortcut promise. It's really the same temptation given to Jesus when he was tempted by the, the devil in the wilderness, taking the top of the, of the temple mount, remember? And the, and the devil says to him, Satan says to him, look, see the kingdoms of the world? I'll give them all to you. I'll give them all to you. You can just bow to me. Just bend the knee to me, and you can have it all. That's what you want, isn't it? All people to be, belong to you? Well, I'll give them to you. I'll remove my deception and my corruption and my perverting influence, and you can have it all if you'll just bend the knee to me. It's a shortcut promise. Same thing for Ananias and Sapphira, and same thing for us in a thousand little ways. Ananias sees Barnabas sell his field and lay the proceeds at the apostles' feet, and he sees the way people admire this man. He sees that he gets a nickname from the disciples, the apostles, right? They call him Barnabas. His name was Joseph, and they call him Son of Encouragement. He got a nickname. I want a nickname. I want the apostles to look at me that way. I want to be somebody important, but I, I'm not sure I can afford to sell it all. You know what, honey? I got an idea. We don't need this field. Let's sell it. We can give some. They don't know how much we sold it for. Besides, we're being generous. It's not like we have to sell it. Let's, let's, we, can get, we can look just the same. You see the hypocrisy in their own heart and in the church? I thought about this since preaching it last week. How did Ananias imagine he would pull this off without being found out? How do you think he'd get away with it? I mean, the Holy Spirit is, people are speaking in tongues. The, people have discernment. Peter's filled with the Holy Spirit. The apostles are seeing that things happen and healing. Doesn't he think that it might come out, that, these guys, that the Holy Spirit might reveal his deception? Do you know what? He's no more foolish than you and I are when we think God is not fully aware of our little hypocrisies, of our little pretenses. Have you ever been guilty of trying to impress someone spiritually? Or for any reason? Have you ever tried to tell the story in just such a way that somebody else looks a little bit less and you look a little bit more? To appear more than you really are. Look at verse 4 of chapter 5. Peter nails this right on the head. 
he says to Ananias in verse 4, While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? What is it you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to God, to man, but to God. See that last line? I'll translate it in my way. Who do you think you're kidding? Who are you fooling? You're not fooling me. You're not lying to me. You're lying to God. Do you think he doesn't know, Ananias? You think he doesn't see? Now turn that inward for a minute. You think God doesn't know how you behave at work? You think he's unaware of how you treat your spouse when you're not here? You think he doesn't know what's in your heart? You think he doesn't see the little deceptions, the little steps away from innocence, the little lies you tell to protect yourself? You think God doesn't know? And I can turn it on my own self. He knows. Who are we kidding? Who do you think you're lying to? The only one whose opinion really matters in your life already knows all. Knows all. That's what Peter says to him. Next, living the lie. And Ananias believed that he could get away, but he lives, he acts on that belief. You know, when you listen to a lies long enough, you start to believe them. When you believe them long enough, you start to act on them and live them. And you live in that lie long enough, and you can no longer discern truth from falsehood. Isn't that true? It's been true in my life. You hear a lie long enough, you start to think that's right. I, 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 I believe that. You believe it long enough, you actually, you walk in that, you act upon that. You act upon that long enough, and you can't tell the difference anymore. Even in your own life. You can't hear the voice of God anymore. Notice verse 7 and 8. So, and uh, Sapphira comes in. Her husband's dead. She doesn't know this. She comes in later on. And uh, Peter, he gives her a chance. He says to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. Now, she could, what could she say? So much the implication there is that the, the price that they had said they sold it for, they said they were giving all. And she says, yes, for so much. She has an opportunity, doesn't she? Peter the Apostle standing before her saying, is this what you sold it for? She had a, mo she has a moment, an opportunity for her to do what? No, no, it's been a ruse. No, he didn't. To repent, to confess, to come clean. Oh, yes, for so much, she says. She's living in the lie. It's, this is the direction of my life now. I'm sold out to this deception. I don't know if you ever noticed this in Scripture, how harshly Jesus speaks uh, to, to the hypocrites and how merciful and compassionate he is to those who are externally pretty wicked tax collectors, sinners, I mean prostitutes and other sinners in Matthew chapter 23 he has these seven woes seven woes he pronounces on the Pharisees if you have your Bible it's not on the screens but you can turn there with me Matthew 23 verse 16 Woe to you, blind guides, he says, you blind fools. Verse 23, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Then in verse 27, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Verse, Luke 12, verse 1, Jesus says, the hypocrisy of the Pharisees he calls leaven, that uh, bacterial agent that's in dough to make it rise. He says, beware the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Seems like it's no big deal. It's just a little bit. But it works its way into the whole batch. And before you know it, it's corrupted everything. Beware of that. Beware of the pretense in your own heart. Beware of the temptation to spin things in your favor. Beware of little deceptions in your life. Like, for example, my wife, I, I so badly, her opinion matters to me more than, than most people, and it should. And so there'll be little things, like she'll say, did you mail that bill? And I have a, a propensity to forget things. And so I, sometimes I leave things undone. Did you mail that, Jeff? Oh, yeah, yeah, I mailed it. I mailed it. I know it's in my briefcase. And I think to myself, well, I'm going to mail it, and she's never going to know. And this way she won't be disappointed in me, and we won't have a fight. That's a lie. I'm telling my wife a lie. I'm stepping away from the truth. Maybe not a big deal, but it is. Because the next lie might be bigger, and it's easier to tell if I told that one. And the next lie is bigger, and it gets easier to tell because I told that one. And before you know it, I'm standing on the precipice of a whole life of deception. How'd I get there? Little steps away 
and that part of my heart to be a truthful man. I don't think Ananias and Sapphira woke up and decided, let's lie. Let's, let's, let's just fool everybody and, not, and just be deceptive. Little steps, little steps, little steps away from a relationship with Christ into living the lie and you can't discern the voice of God anymore and you're not even sure what's true anymore and you find yourself in a place going, how did I get here? How did this happen? You know, it's tempting to read this story and to think to ourselves, the punishment is way too harsh. When I read it first, I thought, okay, they lied, I get that. They, they, were, they were full of hypocrisy, I get that. Why not, you know, like, okay, why not call them out and have them repent? Like, why do they have to drop dead? I mean, why that? That just seems so over the top. I mean, they, they were giving money to the church. Yeah, they were deceitful a little bit about it, but why so severe with these two? And in fact, we think that it's not fair, right? How many of you, when you were, your parents, when your kids were little, you had to keep everything fair? At Christmas time? You know, when you go shopping for presents, and you, my wife and I agonize, right? Do we buy, how do we figure out how it's fair? Is it the number of things to open, or is it the total amount spent? Well, when they're five, it, they don't care how much is spent. They want the same number of presents to open, right? When they're older, they're maybe more nuanced. And so you're worried about fairness. My kids are like, well, Noah got a cell phone at 13. Why don't I get mine? I'm 13, right? It's got to be fair. We grow up in a society where everything seems to be, even in our, we're fighting over this politically right now. Is it fair? Is life fair for everybody? Uh, equal opportunity. We, 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 we live in a world where this, we have this notion of fairness. Spiritually speaking, friends, this is hard to hear, but I have to tell you the truth. Spiritually speaking, we should all be eternally grateful that God does not operate on the basis of fairness. Because if he did, there'd be a lot of folks dropping dead tonight. None of us deserve grace. None of us deserve a second chance. None of us, before a holy and perfect God, deserve his love and forgiveness and mercy. Really, the miracle is that he, in almost every other case in history, doesn't operate that way. He's merciful and gracious and compassionate. This brings us to facing the truth. Believing the lie, living the lie, and then facing the truth. The hard truth is that Ananias and Sapphira were not treated unfairly or unjustly. They got exactly what they deserved. By the way, it's important also to point out, this is not Peter's judgment here. Peter, nowhere are we told that Peter knew this was going to happen or that he pronounced sentence. In fact, Peter may have been surprised as anybody. This is the act, an act of God. And we must learn to come to this story not from the perspective of our cultural age of tolerance and fairness, but from God's holy perspective. Our natural inclination is to think, well, really it isn't so bad. It's not a big deal compared to other things. I mean, there's other sins that are, that are more wicked. But it is a big deal to God. It's a very big deal to God. The church in Acts is still in its infancy. Authenticity and purity are essential for its survival. I mean, it's only in one location. It's only in Jerusalem. This is the beginning of God's plan to redeem the world through his, pe through the, the, his people on earth. They're, it's crucial that they stay radically committed to him. So, frankly, God removes a potential threat. And I've been pondering this. We're never told in the story if Ananias and Sapphira are Christians or not. I mean, we're never told if they're true believers who got caught up in this deception. That can happen. And wandered away from the truth. And were confused by a lie. And God just took them to protect the, the community of faith. We don't know that. Or were they never really committed to Jesus? Was it all just a ruse, playing a spiritual religious game, but never really had their hearts transformed? I don't know. But the point is, if, they, if we were told they weren't real believers, we could dismiss it, oh, well, see, they weren't believers. Or if they were, we could think, well, you know, that's just... I think the point is for us to be sober about our own lives. Verse 11, and great fear came upon the whole church and everyone who heard this. You think? God uses this event, we'll see in weeks to come, to galvanize his people, almost a revival moment, to, to center them. Not fear in terms of being terrified of being zapped by God if you step out of line, but awe, reverence. All right, last question then. How does God deal with hypocrisy in the hearts of his people today? How does he do it now? How does he deal with 
your pretense, mine. Your temptation to pretend you're something you're not, and mine. In a word, through the gospel. Through the gospel. The gospel frees us from our desperate need to pretend, our need for approval of others. You see, the gospel's message is, you're a mess. You're not any good. You can't measure up. But God, who made the universe and all that exists, loves you with an everlasting love and gives you his favor in Christ. If you will but repent, fall on your knees, and turn to him, you'll have the opinion of the only one who matters in the universe. And if you have his favor, if then God, through Christ, looks at you and says, my beloved daughter, my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased, why do you have to pretend anymore? And I'm preaching to myself here. I go to peace pastors' conferences, right? I'm around other pastors who have written books and have blogs and big churches, and I sort of feel like, you know, like, oh, there's something. I wish I, I, I want to be somebody. I want to be on that. I don't have to pretend, because the only one who matters. My son, Noah, just played his last high school football game tonight. They lost. Out of the playoffs, it's over. You know, there's a part of me drove away going, I can't believe I have to preach tonight. I'm so depressed. <laughs> you know? Driving here. And it's, it's hard when, it's, when you give yourself to a game like that and a, your brothers and it's over then, you know? It's just done. But the truth is, he already has the favor of his earthly father and his heavenly father. And he, what matters, he has. If you know Jesus Christ, the opinion of the one who matters, you have. He loves you. Why do you pretend? Why do you lie? Why do you cover up? Why do you hide? Why do we? The gospel frees us from this. If believing and living the lie is hypocrisy, then facing the truth really is the gospel. The truth about us and the truth about God's love for us. So let me ask you this last question. Who knows you? Who really knows your life? Who knows all about you besides Jesus? Because he does. But in your life, what human friend or relationship knows the dirty little secrets, knows the part of you that you wish you'd like to keep hidden. If you say, just my spouse, I tell you that's good, but it's probably not enough. Who in your life is, have you given permission to to ask you the hard questions about how you're really doing, what's really going on? If you're here and you're saying, mm, nobody really, I would tell you, spiritually speaking, you're a sitting duck. You're in a dangerous place. I have a group of men in my life. We ask each other a series of questions, and I like them and love them too much to lie to them. You know, we all can cover up and lie. Who knows you? The Christian life is not meant to be lived in isolation. In fact, it's dangerous to try to live it on your own. You will not make it. You will not, at the very least, you won't grow into the man or woman God wants you to be. At worst, you'll slip into a deception and lie and a cover-up. Secrecy and hypocrisy flourish in the church when the gospel is not preached. I don't just mean from the pulpit now and then. I mean to each other, right? So face-to-face -face as Christian brothers and sisters to say, you're forgiven. God has forgiven you. Stop pretending. Stop acting like that. That's gone. You don't have to pretend. I think the church, sadly, in America is a place where there's a lot of pretending going on. A lot of folks come in and we look good and we show up and we want to get our sort of our, our dosage for the week. My, give me my dose of Christianity so I can make it the rest of the week. That's not what God intends. The rest of the world that we live in is putting pressure on us, on our children, on our own hearts to measure up to a certain standard, to pretend that we have, to cover up our inadequacies. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is saying, stop that. Come out. Come into the light. Let my light shine on you. Only when you do that can you know how much you're loved. That's his, that's his desire for us. So I know you read this story and it can seem like it's harsh. And, and, and it feels like God's angry. I actually think it's a beautiful story. It's a story about God's deep love for his people. Loves them so much. He cares about every little, every little bit of their heart. That we would be men and women of truth and generosity, and compassion, with no pretense. Let's stand together for closing prayer. And after I pray, you'll be dismissed. And if there's somebody here who would like someone to pray with them, feel free to come forward. We'd love to meet with you down at the close of the service. Father, we thank you for the power of your gospel. 
which frees us from the need to pretend, which frees us from self-worship, which frees us to love you and to love others in return. Thank you, God, for this sobering story. Lord, may all of our hearts be laid bare before you. May you, by your Holy Spirit, unveil and uncover what is in us that's not pleasing and heal us from the inside out. We thank you, Jesus, and we love you in your name and for your sake. Amen.